Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again to another... I was going to say debate then. I don't know if this is going to be a debate, because this is the interesting place we're at now, isn't it, David? We're kind of out of the films where we know we disagree on, and now we're into kind of new territory. Yeah, it's, I, you know, there may be many debates involved, mm. but this is more of a discussion of, um, as you've put it, you know, what are the things that connect with us in a particular movie versus other, and are they the same things? And I think what we're mm. going to find out based on our our proclivity to these movies, that it's not going to be the same thing. Exactly. And I think Dine of the Day is a really good film for us to start with, because uh, this is a this is a roller coaster of tone and different people like different things about it. So I'm, yeah, very curious to know how we uh, where we match up and where we uh, where we disagree. So it's I'm super be- curious. And it is it's probably the best way to start, because I was going to say this film dare I say, it's become almost like a view to a kill that it's become fashionable. And I'm putting that in major air quotes. It's become fashionable to dislike it. So everybody has to dislike it. And God forbid you say you like any part of it. People question your authority and, and reason for living. Um, but I'm, I think we can test that today a little bit. I think comparing it to a view to a kill is perfect because I think it's exactly, it's in that place where like, uh, cause I know there are quite a few fans of this film or, you know, yeah. uh, it, uh, maybe defend is too strong a word because much like A View to a Kill, I know that people acknowledge that the film has an awful lot of faults, but some people get an awful lot of enjoyment out of it. And I think that that's the, that's the key thing. And uh, yeah, I think we're gonna see through this where we take our enjoyment in Dine of the Day. It's um, gonna be amazing. Yeah, so thank you for joining me as always, David. I know that we, we were messaging each other last night. It's like, oh God, now we've actually got to watch it in preparation. Well, and to your point about people defending this, I did a quick little Instagram saying, I don't think there's enough alcohol in my house to watch Die Another Day. And you wouldn't believe the people defending the movie. What are you doing? I hope you don't rip this apart. So I love the fact that this has defenders. Yeah, totally. Because as you say, it has the reputation of being the, the bad one. Yeah. And well, actually, let, let, let's get into it then, because my first point is I, I always kind of like it when we start off these uh, discussions by talking about the context, like how we came to the film when it first came out. Because mm. um, this was, for me, it was the first Bond film I saw at the cinema. I was like 12, 13 years old, I think, when it came out. So it oh was gosh. just like my Bond fandom had been going for a few years. And this was like the first one. And, you know, when you're a 12 year old seeing this and it's the latest thing, it's the best. Like I still remember seeing it with my dad coming out of the cinema. I remember going back with friends the next week and we were all like really, uh, really into it. And then the tide started to turn a few years later, I think. Like I remember the, you know, it had a good buzz initially. Is that how you remember it as well? Absolutely. And and a real quick question for you. Were you into the video games at that point as well? Yes, totally. Yeah. Agent Under Fire was out. I think Nightfire had either just come out or was just on the horizon. And that had Pierce Brosnan's Bond in the, you yeah. know, in the Aston Martin Vanquish and in the snow and stuff. So it felt it felt like a tie-in game, even though it wasn't uh, you know, the game isn't dying of the day. Yeah, so that's really significant for me to explain my perception when I first saw this. Now mm-hmm. I was fully, fully into uh, dressing like Bond, the mm. Bond suits, the Bond shoes. I really got into, you know, the story, Tomorrow Never Dies. I mean, here is the, uh, I'm wearing right now the watch, for example, that he has in Die Another Day. And ah, it happens dude. to be the one from The World Is Not Enough and Tomorrow Never Dies. So I was into the whole lifestyle aspect as a young executive when this came out. Mm. So I went into it like this was a major event. Mm. Die Another Day was a major event. But the reason I asked about the video games is I was really into the video games. And when I first saw this movie, I didn't walk away thinking, you know, view to a kill part two. (laughs) Um, I thought, oh, my gosh, they did it. They made the best James Bond film ever, because to me, so many aspects of it were lifestyle and they felt like a video game. They were bombastic. They were fantasy oriented. Um, I'm sure we'll get into the different scenes, but some of the scenes like on the plane are just almost like a video game going from level to level. You've got the bosses that you have to fight and destroy. And so I remember very well, I'll tell you a quick story. I remember very well calling a friend and just saying like, oh my gosh, have you seen it? It's absolutely amazing. He goes, yeah, I saw it. We talking about the same movie, <laughs> like he thought I was crazy, but I think I had this this bond high going into it that eventually 
came down. When did it sort of come down for you? Did it take up until like Casino Royale coming out? Or was it before then? Do you remember when the backlash kind of came? Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, well before Casino Royale, but well mm -hmm. after my first viewing. So went and saw it a bunch like everybody else in the theater. It wasn't until probably the Blu-ray, was it Blu-ray already or was it DVD? I don't know, uh, I can't remember. I guess DVD, yeah. And yeah, it'll have been DVD and yeah. Okay, so when the DVD came out, I remember watching it and strangely enough, I saw it once on DVD and I didn't really want to see it again. Huh. I'm like, what's going on here? And that started the 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 crust coming off of this 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 pie and then looking inside of it and going, ooh, this is really problematic. And then I just started to analyze it and it kind of went south. Yeah, no, I I think I'm very similar then in a lot of ways. It was, I think it was kind of the birth of like internet forums and actually going on those things and like reading what other people thought. And, you know, at, at, at the age I was at, I was very much like a sponge, like taking in like a lot of other people's like critiques and stuff. And so you would see people on forums, like really like pointing out a lot of the stuff that is kind of, well, we'll, we'll get into it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel like I kind of soaked all that up. So by the time Casino Royale came out, I was like quite, quite down on it i guess sometimes. well i will i will tell the viewers on your channel right now although they've probably seen it in a little bit of research for this video i went and saw some of young calvin dyson's oh, other God. videos <laughs> so you did a die another day review 10 years ago oh god it's fine you did great you were amazing <laughs> and, and just as charming as, as now but more importantly 10 years ago you pretty much called it a shit sandwich mm. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe you even used worse words than that. Quite possibly. Yeah. I remember so yeah, a lot of swearing going on in, in that one. Oh yeah. Uh well, I think we'll get into it now and see Perfect. kind of where we're at now, because nearly 20 years after it's come out, which is insane to think of. But yeah. um well, should we start? We very seldom talk about gun barrel sequences in these things because it's we so often to, the same thing. We have to talk about this yeah. one. Obviously, the bullet comes flying out uh, of the gun barrel. How do you feel about it? You know something, this time around, um, I didn't mind it. Certainly I was waiting for it. Um, I think that they were just trying to do something new and special for around the anniversary and, and just to kind of shake it up. Interestingly, though, they didn't go back to it. So mm. I always find with Bond films when somebody somewhere says, oh, you know what, we got to just do something different. My, my question is why? I mean, mm. is there something broken with it? You know, are you trying to do something just for different sake? I love the music. Mm. to the opening thing um you know the david arnold had a, a techno beat to this soundtrack that i'm sure we'll talk about that he really put into the gun barrel and i found myself kind of like doing my little shoulder thing like a tick 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 thing when i watched it but the bullet i found unnecessary mm. and just kind of neutral to me okay i like what about I you I think the director talks about in some of the behind the scenes stuff where he says that it, you know they were kind of intending it as like a little one off like for the 40th anniversary a little gag and then we kind of you know would be back to normal on the next one the thing is we haven't been back to normal with the gun barrel sequences i know it was at the start of spectre but we didn't get the you know the iris kind of moving around and then opening up so yeah. it only occurred to me watching it i was like god i've never seen a, a bond film at the cinema that's had like just a proper you know a new bond film at the cinema that's had the proper classic gun barrel sequence and then it open up and yeah Hopefully I'm going to get that at some point, but I, I, I kind of like it. It's yeah. a it, it, it's a cute little thing. And I think it does set up the tone of what this is going to be. I think the CGI looks a bit crummy. Um, it's quite audacious. It's quite in your face. And I think that does kind of set a bit of a tone. But and that leads into the pre-credit sequence. Um, this whole hovercraft stuff going on, all of the stunt work. Um, I think it's a pretty great classic sort of Bond pre-credit sequence. It's all this stunt work that you have, you don't see. And other things I like that they're doing it on hovercrafts, which is nice and new, unique and very Bondian. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really with it for like this first like 10 minutes or so, the great surfing stuff as well. Um, how do you feel about it? So this is where we're gonna get into a theme that I'm gonna have throughout this discussion. And the theme is, I went into this video when you and I first talked about it thinking, oh, the, the, the film is in two halves for me. I love the first half, dislike the second half. It's not going to be that easy. I found mm. that I've had to become surgical and forensic with this film. So if even in that 10 minutes, there are things, I, I don't like the surfing. Um, I Ooh. think, you know, Brosnan is very capable, but, you know, seeing him surf and then pull off the thing just seems very strange. 
to me, like I, I'm not buying it for a second. Um, I'm not saying this hip is going to break, but come on. And then I do like some of the gadgets. I love the, the Brosnan smirk and the taking of the glasses. I love that particular part. Um, and I love the bad guy at this part of the movie mm. when he is, you know, the Korean who's just, you know, very much against the West, but adopting some of the things of the West. Um, I love the little gadget moments and, and kind of press stuff that he has, like ah. when, when Zhao takes the, uh, the phone and kind of takes a picture. And this is, um, this is the correct phone from the movie, which he takes and gets all the information. Amazing. I love that it's Bond undercover, but to me, when the hovercraft thing starts, I think it was an ambitious idea that just seems very slow. Hmm. And I can't stand some of the editing. This like blade, you know, Marvel blade, like type, you know, staccato editing and sometimes the slow-mo and then the focusing and Lee Tamahori, even from the beginning, starts to grate on me at this part. It's it's aggressively of its day, I think. Like that kind of editing, like I'm thinking of movies like Triple X, like Matrix, like that kind of, um, and, and it's very much the Bond film trying to bring in some of those influences, I think. It's grown on me, I'll say that much. I don't know if it's just because I get nostalgia because you don't see it all that much in movies these days. But yeah, um, I, I, yeah it, it transports me back a bit to being like a 12, 13 year old and seeing that kind of stuff on the big screen. And uh, I, 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 I think they do a fairly good job with the hovercrafts to give it pace, even though as, you know, as vehicles, as you say, they are like naturally quite slow. Yeah. I think they do... I think they, they make it kind of work. I still, though, remember very distinctly seeing this in the cinema, the groan that came from the audience when Bond has his Saved by the Bell line. That that groan is like stuck there in the back of my head. I can't see that little scene without hearing it. So I walked away last night after viewing this thinking two things about Brosnan's Bond in this, and that is mm -hmm. I love when he's doing nonverbal things. Mm -hmm. You know, his actions, his grimace, his smirks, like the little Bond things. But honestly, and I'm sure we're going to get into it, they surround him with dialogue and lines and one-liners that are just some of the most cringeworthy in mm -hmm. the entire franchise. And but, I mean, he, he pulls it off with a plum. You know, he pulls it off with a lot of charm. But even he can't fully pull it off without me going like, I'm kind of embarrassed for him. It, it, it's, you know, you've said a couple of things now that are in my notes as like notes that I've made. I think we're actually going to be fairly similar in our broad, like I've got written down, you know, I kind of like this film when people aren't talking. <laughs> it's like, as long as there isn't dialogue, I think it tends to work quite well. Exactly. Um, and I also have something similar about, uh, yeah, like people often say like, oh, I like the first half of it and not the second half and, and that kind of thing. Whereas I think you're right. I think you need to be a bit more surgical with it actually to kind of pick out the bits that you like and don't like, because I'm yeah. a bit up and down throughout the thing. Well, because then you, to your point, you have that, you know, saved by the bell groan worthy thing. But then I love before they get into the Madonna song, the whole thing where he's a prisoner of war and, mm. you know, they've got the, the, the scorpions kind of ah. biting him and hanging down and all the little prop stuff all over the place. I mean, it, those moments of seeing Bond and then eventually afterwards, I, I just, they're gems. They're some of the best in the entire franchise. I love those moments. It's a real shame that they don't capitalize on it more, I think. Like, it is kind of just, it, it, it's, it doesn't track throughout the whole film. It is like this 10, 15 minute chunk. And Brosnan's brilliant. Like, I think with the beard and the hair and he's acting like he, in his voice, he sounds like he hasn't spoken months. Like when they ask him, you know, how he's doing, tell it to the concierge and all that, um, which I think is lovely. Uh, I, I just wish that it tracked more throughout the thing because we kind of lose it when he gets to the hotel a bit later on. Agreed. Uh, okay, so you mentioned Madonna there. Oh. That is what comes up next. <laughs> the, the title sequence, the, yeah. uh, the song. Uh, where do you stand on the song? You know, I, I went into it with a different approach. I, mm. I wanted to just hear it last night as a song. So I actually looked away from the visuals and just listened to it. And to me, I can't believe I'm saying this. It's not a horrible song. I just don't think it's a good Bond song. It doesn't fit in the, the whole legend of Bond songs. It doesn't feel like a Bond song. There's no emotional 
connection for me. It's too techno. You know, that's the other thing. And I know Arnold, for example, did go and he even said it uh, in some of the behind the scenes that he went very techno for this. And you, you really feel it. So although I don't and won't listen to it in my car, I don't think it's a horrible song. Okay. Yeah. What about um, you? I quite like it. I, I've oh. heard it like out and about in clubs in London and stuff, like not even like, you know, on a Bond playlist or anything. Like I hear oh. it in bars and stuff. So it's recently? It's, uh, oh, no, not recently. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, like, you know, like maybe a year ago, something like that. Still, that's uh, pretty recent. Yeah. I mean, I guess I haven't been to Soho in that long. So that's probably why <laughs> I haven't heard it. But uh, I, I, I you know, I, I I liked it when it first came out. And then I think I like soaked in too much of the negativity and started pushing back on it. And then I just started listening to it, not as just like in and amongst Bond songs, but right. just as a song or just as a pop yes. song. And I kind of like it. It's, yeah. but so I completely agree. And I think it is because they clearly wanted a huge name for this. And Madonna is a massive icon of the industry. Yeah. And did, uh, did, do you understand the lyrics? <laughs> any better because i i don't sigmund freud sigmund analyze freud. This. analyze this analyze this, <laughs> analyze this. Yeah. uh nope i have no idea what any of that means but she has a really good music video if you've ever seen the music video of it's it it's very cool yeah with her and like there's odd job in there and mm -hmm. golden girls and stuff it's one of the better bond music videos ironically enough the least bond sounding song has one of the most bondian music videos oh, wow. but yeah Okay, so we do have this whole chunk of the film where we have the disavowed Bond, yes. and we, we get M coming in, and it really feels like they're fine-tuning what they're going to do with her character for the next few with Craig. Like, she's very confrontational with him. Like, re like when she says, like, uh, what, what's the line about... Um, you know, you're, you're no use to anyone now. I know. And that's like, so like that really, I, I felt that this time I'd forgotten about that line. And I was like, oof, that's really hard to hear actually from her to Bond. It's uh, maybe it's too mean. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I actually made a note. I'm like, I'm not digging M in mm. this movie. And the subsequent Judy Dench ones from GoldenEye through to this movie, and certainly the ones afterwards, I love her. I mean, she could read a phone book. I just wasn't liking her. I think that their chemistry was not very good, even when they did reconnect, you know, once they went back into the underground. Mm. Um, I just, I didn't, she was just mean. Yeah. And M always has a persnicketiness to them, all the people that played M, but there's never mean. It's cantankerous mm. almost. It's frustrated. But this was just like, I mean, to, to leave with a line like that of, you know, you're no good to anyone. You could have said something like, you know, right now, you're really not being helpful. So yeah. chill the hell out. I mean, <laughs> I'm no writer, but that just felt weird. I completely agree, particularly with the trajectory that her character has been on in the previous three. It felt like if she's like, and you know, I'm comparing this to Skyfall as well, where she, you know, orders a shot that, you know, potentially kills Bond. And the whole film is about kind of her character and her journey and appreciating yeah. him and all that. And it feels like if they're going to go that mean with her, like they do here, then they need to track that through and they don't. It's it's really, she, she's really harsh because she is just kind of like, you're useless. Well, now you're useful later on in the film, but you never get any yeah. sense on an emotional level. It's all just very... Yeah, this I don't is know. a miss. This is a miss by the writers. And I'll tell you mm. why. Think about the audiences when they went to go see Die Another Day, just coming off of The World Is Not Enough. Yeah. And the Bond M relationship there, for God's sake, saving her and their connection, really emotional connection, great lines and banter. In this one, you don't get that. And then you get Judy Dench just kind of like, you know, giving evil eyes to the Americans and stuff like that. And like, it told you so moments. They're just, I, I, no, it was a miss for me in this. Yeah. Okay, we agree on this then. Yeah. yeah that's, uh -oh. uh, <laughs> well, I, I want to um, talk about some lifestyle moments now, actually, because I was Ooh. curious to know how it, how this film ranked for you on a lifestyle uh, element, because Bond escapes and he goes to this hotel and all of a sudden he's, you know, shaving his beard off and he's got all of the, you know, he's got the Bollinger, he's got the shirts like lined out and all that kind of stuff. Did that feel like that was, I guess my question is, did that feel too much to you? Was that too obviously product placement? Because normally I think they're a bit more, um, it feels more organic. This felt like, okay, this is the product shot where we're going to have all the shirts lined up and all that. Um, it was probably one step too far. 
Right. I still loved it. I mean, for yeah. me, it was very Fleming in the sense that Fleming would describe mm. these things even by brands. And so even moving around the room felt to me, believe it or not, that that was like a very Fleming moment. Now, that being said, when I interviewed Rachel Grant, who's in the movie, she told me that Bollinger was on set, Brioni was on set to make sure their shirts looked beautiful. Bollinger made sure that there was just the right amount of like dew and sweat on the ice bucket. I mean, this was a product placement moment. Let's not fool ourselves. So that's the part I felt was like a little too far. The shaver, everything, you see the mm. packaging of the shaver. Why would you have the packaging of the shaver out? That was <laughs> a little bit too far. But I loved showing Bond get cleaned up. I mean, I love seeing him in, in, in this quiet lifestyle moment where by the time he's from the pajamas to five minutes later, where he's in a gorgeous, gorgeous, you know, Brioni suit with the Turnbull tie, he looks the part. I think if I was to give the whole film kind of a clothing or sartorial score, I'd give it a B mm. as opposed to an A. I'd, I'd give it um, a relatively high score. But to me, there's not a lot of casual Bond moments. There's mm. the one where he's in Cuba and he's disguised and everybody likes that crazy tropical shirt. Yeah. But it's not like I walked away from this film going, I'm going to emulate Bond. I'm right. going to do those things. Now, I did buy the shaver at the time. So I guess it did work a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think of the lifestyle moment, especially that one? I guess it felt more gratuitous to me in this one, in, in places. Um, like there's bits where I actually think like when he gets to Havana and he's ordering the mojito or mojito, as Brosnan <laughs> sort of pronounces it uh, in his very exaggerated way. I kind of like that moment where he's just like chilling mm. at the bar. Um, there were a few nice bits, but overall I felt like it was just a bit too in your face. Um, yeah. Like I said, I think I think the Phillips shaver is one because I'm not quite sure he'd get rid of that entire beard with, with that. I guess that he's just doing the... So I did a video review of that shaver where I had a beard and shaved it with only that razor. I need to see this video now. Okay. It's, it's on YouTube That's... right now. You can see it. And I did it literally from that scene. And I wasn't as shaggy as his, but it was yeah. pretty shaggy. Huh. Interesting. And I was, I was shocked that it worked. I was thinking of your video with Rachel Grant, actually, which I really enjoyed the interview um, and kind of wishing that she was in the film more after that. Know. You know, she's in quite a short scene, but when you interviewed her and she has so much personality and she's got such a brilliant, infectious energy, I was uh, kind of hoping she'd be in it more, really. But And she's amazing, too. I mean, she's such a great storyteller. Mm. of her time filming and and you could really tell from her and this this does elevate the film for me i mean when you know somebody from the film obviously but even more so behind the scenes when she was talking about the care that went mm. into this film i mean as much as we bang on tamahori she said that the producers for example and the people that really built the sets and things like that were so serious about this i mean this mm. could have been you know dr no to them that's how serious they didn't see it as a fluff movie at all well, there is that interview clip that you see of Brosnan like promoting the film where I think, I don't think they'd started filming just yet, but they'd like got a script locked in place and he's like talking about it as being this quite dark, like it, I, when you read it, like on paper, describing this plot, it does sound like one of the darker ones with Bond being captured yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But for some reason in the presentation, it just, just gets a little bit lost. But um, this does bring us to the Havana sequence, which I know a lot of people really like, where he goes and he has the he has the meeting with the almost Karen Bay-like character and he's smoking the cigars mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And um, the I find it slightly distracting that it's so clearly not you know Havana it's uh, I think do they film in Portugal or something like that it just there's something about it that just doesn't look exotic enough for me um how did you did that throw that? you off quite a bit then for that oh scene? yeah yeah oh and like there's something about the water when Jinx does come out of the water <laughs> and it's so obviously supposed to be a reproduction of the uh Ursula Andrews moment but completely overblown with slow motion and she's like stood there like a model but the the blue in the water it just it wasn't there. It just looked kind of, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. There was something quite basic about it, maybe. I have a love-hate relationship with the Cuba scenes. Okay. Um, the love part is I do like the moment, the, you know, Karen Bay moment with mm. the guy who has the cigars, um, who helps him out. I love all those moments, even the tongue and cheeks. It stops. Here comes the hate. It stops. <laughs> I'm sorry, when we get to the Holly Berry part. And I didn't even mind him at the bar, but mm. you know, 
her whole thing, the slow motion, like you said, the the awful lines, the lack of energy that she brings forth in her character and lines is palatable. And we'll talk about her, I'm sure, later with some of the action scenes, but I've seen her in Monster's Ball. I mean, I mm. know she can act, but this is the director. I'm almost sure of it, just not getting the most out of these two fine actors. And they're cringeworthy. They mm. just met each other. It's cringeworthy moments. And then I'm not buying the chemistry when they're in bed. So that gets mm. me upset. Listen to me, my voice is rising. Um, <laughs> and it comes back and it's okay once he goes to the clinic because I actually not like, I love the clinic part. I love the nods back to, uh, you know, the Scaramanga Fung House with the mirrors. I love all of that. I love his outfit. Talk about style. I love how he takes a grape, like Bond from, you know, Thunderball and things like that. I love these things. And th those, those nods work very well. They're not heavy handed. But then we're back to her mm. diving off the thing. And I'm like, this is really getting me upset. Like, you know, it's hot and cold applied scientifically. It's like, <laughs> stop. We're really on the same page with this. I I love that there's about a five minute chunk from um, after they've, they've had the sex scene and Brosnan like hits the South African guy and uses him to get into the clinic. And so much of it is, it plays almost like a silent film. You don't need any of the dialogue because it's all just like little yeah. insignificant bits here and there, but just you see the inner workings of his mind. Like when he goes down, he sees the security camera, he looks at the thing and you know like, okay, well, why is that camera there? It just, you are on the journey with him and he's so yeah. cool when he comes through that window and picks up the grape and says hi to the family and then he's on his way it's really really nice i love you, that you nailed it so he is so cool that when mm -hmm. you know she starts showing her pass around ah. and things like that and even when you know she this is supposed to be a badass moment for her mm -hmm. you know when she takes her explosive out in her phone and ah. sets the charge and everything like that um it's supposed to be this moment where you're like oh She's capable. She's just not a, another Ursula Andress coming from mm. the water. And I'm just not buying it. Even it's a very awkward editing when she shoots the doctor. And mm. if you watch it really well, it's a continuity error. It's almost like she raises the gun and he would have already been shot, but he's still standing there like this. Mm. And just those types of directorial moments, what she did and the editing do not work for me completely agree i do wonder if it was something to do with like maybe censorship like maybe they're like mm. cutting around a moment that the censors might have said oh no this is a bit too violent so i i hate that doctor that she meets with because he's so like they just have they have they give him like three lines and they need to make sure that you hate him <laughs> so they have that line in there about oh we're just going to take orphans and runaways and kill them and use their yeah. dna and it's just like oh it's just it's so telegraphed and like so you know it is pitching to well the 12 year olds in the audience like me which i was fine with at the time Daddy, bad doctor bad doctor he's okay that's that's exactly it by the way um, i don't know why i just gave you like a serbian accent i have no <laughs> idea i just assumed oh was that me oh wow that, that was that supposed was... to be little calvin yeah it was, kind, was just kind of accurate in a way <laughs> But I'm with you on um, Halle Berry's jinx as well. I think to your point about them being two fine actors that yeah. are just lumbered with a horrific script. That oh, the moment where she like looks down and she's like, oh, well, there's a mouthful. I hate it so much. It's the pause there. It's so labored. It's yeah, it's really horrible. Can I tell you how classic those lines have become in the Bond community? Mm. Is we often, I know you and I have done it, but we do it with all of our Bond friends. When you want to like grate on somebody's nerves or you try something that's terrible, you literally say, I can learn to like it if yes. I have the time. <laughs> because that line, all those lines are just so, they just send a shiver up my spine like meningitis. <laughs> and, and speaking of shivers, that shot of her going over uh, falling backwards at the end of the action sequence in the clinic, my God, <laughs> it's something else. Oh, so yeah. bad. Yeah, really has not aged well. And by the way, those two guards, why aren't they shooting Bond? They're yeah. just looking at her fall and then they go running off. I'm like, you know, that's the bad guy there, right? You know, yeah. where? <laughs> who knows? Well, speaking of bad guys, actually, oh. 
Um, that was the next point on my agenda because we're at the kind of midpoint in the film and Bond uh, heads back to London. We get London calling um, and we're introduced to Gustav Graves and Miranda who were kind of the main two villains of the um, of the bunch and Zhao as well. He was there at the start and now he's, he's back in it with the diamonds in his face. As a trio, how do they rate for you? Uh, very differently. So mm. um, I will tell you that um, Gustav Graves, I am not a fan of mm. him as a bad guy. I think he is mugging. And again, here is a good actor, a good voice actor too. Um, and he is just mugging for the camera. He's being like the, you know, the twirling mustache bad guy. <laughs> Tire to the stake, um, which is just so off-putting. And I actually found his performance this time because I was really evaluating it very uneven. Mm. He has very subtle moments, you know, where he's not, he's kind of like this and that. And then he's got like these larger than life moments. Mm. And I don't buy the relationship with him and his father. I don't get that arc of like, daddy loves me. I need to get his love. That should have, that was in the words, was in the dialogue, but he doesn't sell it. Um, in fact, it, his performance made me crave the, um, the uh, Korean actor at the beginning. Oh. I think they just yeah. could have kept with him throughout the whole thing. Mm. Uh, I liked Zhao. I thought he was a, a fun henchman, little wooden, um, but I liked the fun, crazy Jaws-like moments. And I do love the diamond facial scarring, the fact that nobody plucked the diamonds out when he was in captivity is <laughs> hysterical. You think that'd be phase one of his gene therapy treatment? Like, like there's a payoff here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, um, I, I do like, and people don't like her. I like Rose, Rose, Rosamanda Pike. What's her oh, name? Rosamond, yeah. Rosamond Pike. I, yeah. I do like her. And she's a fine actress. And she was really young. Like she was very inexperienced at this point. Mm. But I thought she did a very good job for what she had. That surprises me that people don't like her. I, I thought she was generally considered to be one of the uh, best elements of the thing. And say she's like, I think she is like 21 here, Maybe. which is crazy. Um, yeah. But she, I mean, she looks pretty much the exact same now, like nearly 20 years on. She's I just, I mean- Deal with the devil. It, it sounds like we are on exactly the same page yet again. Well, I'm surprised at this actually, because uh, I love Rosamund Pike in everything she's in. I think Miranda Frost is like, uh, uh, funnily enough, despite the name, I think she is like a yeah. spark of something in this film that I'm really attracted to. Zhao, I think if you had to have like a physical henchman character, he's as good as any, he's muscular. Yeah. I think he looks like the, the makeup they do with him because he's supposed to be halfway through this gene therapy and the diamonds are all really cool. It gives him a unique I was gonna visual say, look. I'd love the fact oh. that even the subtle things like they have his necklace, which yes. is a bullet, but inside the necklace, as you can see, Hold on, wait for it. This will never show up on this camera, but um, it actually holds a bunch of conflict diamonds. Ah, amazing. So a lot of people didn't realize that in the movie, but it's those types of details. I think he was fleshed out enough and then mm -hmm. the actor did a nice job with him to your point. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And for, for that kind of part, you don't need, you're, you're looking at those now. Like, I'm like, is he gonna I'm put I'm trying not to drop face? them like I did a switchblade in my groin with you. <laughs> and, um, Gustav Graves, again, we are on such the same page. The mm. the actor that they have in the pre-credit sequence is really good. Yeah. Um, I think he has a couple of like nice, dry, dark, humored lines like about his anger management therapist and all that kind of stuff, which is really nice. But Toby Stevens, and again, this is an actor who I've liked in other things. And um, to your point about him being a voice actor, I know that he's quite acclaimed for the audio books, yeah. the uh, Fleming audio books. And I think, he's a, I think he's better in the video game 007 Legends where he came back to voice Gustav Graves again. For some reason, even though it's a video game, it's a more subtle performance than <laughs> what, he get, what, what he gives here. You'd think it'd be the other way around, but there's just a lip snarl too many. It's I hate the bit when all the reporters are asking him questions after his parachuted down because they just want to throw all of these details about his character at you really quickly, which is why all of their questions are so on the nose and expository. That's a really good point, Calvin, because one of the things with our favorite bad guys from the franchise is they're a bit scary, maniacal, very mm -hmm. intelligent. In this case, honestly, the thing that I think the audience walks away with, that I walked away with, is the guy's an asshole. Yeah. And you never want to think that the bad guy, his superpower is he's just a super asshole. Mm. And that's what this guy is. Yeah, that, that's bang on the money. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I, how do you feel about, because we have this whole chunk of the film now in London, and mm. it's very much uh, Graves and Bond meet in a polite company, but it leads to an action sequence, the fencing scene. I, I, I might, we might disagree on this. I'm really not a big fan of this fencing scene. I, I think it's a bit too aggressive too soon. I think of like the initial Bond villain meeting, it needs to be like the golf scene in Goldfinger where there's this rising tension, but it's never gonna boil over into something that wouldn't be uh, deemed acceptable in public. Here, they're just going for each other in this like setting, which is a beautiful location, but uh, I I just felt like it went from zero to 11 too quickly. So I think we may have our first minor disagreement uh-huh. but it's only a minor one because i think this is a good scene but not a great scene so mm-hmm. to me it's a good scene because it does really try very very hard to have a fleming moment to mm-hmm. have that moment where bond is going against the baddie before the mission really starts and getting on each other's nerves and you know he excuse the pun foils him oh, <laughs> i worked on all, all that all night a fencing um, pun wow mm-hmm. we've gone highbrow with this there'll be more but <laughs> Uh, the the reality is, is to your point, the reason it's not great is because the execution is not great. Mm. Um, again, you've got Gustav Graves' performance of just being this like idiot ass, you know, snarky, uh, entitled. No. Mm. And then on top of that, they do go too far. I mean, mm. they're pulling swords off and things like that. And it's just, it's a little bit too much. And then the kicker. I'm sorry. I have to talk about it. I know where we're going with this. Madonna being shoehorned. And again, here's a woman who Evita and and Desperately Seeking Susan, I've seen her act. I know she Mm -hmm. can act. This was like this wooden kind of awful performance of like, and and, and the cringe lines here are at their pinnacle. Mm -hmm. I mean, keeping the tip up and all these things. And by the way, no reason to have this role. It does not further the story at all. Yeah. Well, the only thing that she talks about is uh, Miranda, you know, uh, something about she's in the Olympics and she, right. yeah, which, 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 it, which it, the guy, the guy who hands Bond the little envelope at the end, the Rastafarian guy yeah. could have been leaning into him and said like, oh, that's da, 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 da. She did it. Yeah. And then you could have had him come around at the end. Mm. What is this woman doing here? If anything, it makes MI6 just seem so incompetent that how could they not know that bit of information and that could possibly tip them off that she's a double agent? It's ridiculous. But yeah, I I agree. It does stop the film dead in its tracks because you're just like, oh God, what is this? And I'm barely even paying attention to her because I'm, I mean, like you say, it's so cringy. Brosnan's taking ages to do her corset thing at the back because it's all through this dialogue scene. And it's like, I thought it was like one, like, you know, knot that needed doing. I've never fitted a corset, so I've never, so I don't know. Maybe it does take that long. I wouldn't know. And he's, and he's it, just think about the direction of this from the director. Mm. Like literally you see Brosnan put down his foil and his mask and he's coming over and he's doing this and he's kind of like looking like, oh, this is a hard chore. Like who, who set up this scene? Yeah. It's crazy. But then we're into, maybe we'll disagree on this again because we stay in London. We have a cue scene. Well, we have, a, to your point about video game stuff earlier on, actually, we have a very video game scene where Bond is in this virtual reality thing shooting around uh, MI6. Um, I've always loved it. I love that scene. I love the Q scene. I like John Cleese's Q, to be honest. I, okay. I would have liked more with him. I, uh, I've i grown to love all of that. I think I loved it at first and I hated it, all of the all of the Q branch sort of relics that are in the um, in the thing. It felt so uh, overboard. Now I really like it. Um, I even like the Aston Martin reveal, the, the whole invisible car thing. I really like, actually. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel about this whole... So this, this is me getting surgical again, because there, are, there ah. are some parts that I love about this and some parts where I'm like... And again, minor differences in mm. what we like and what we don't like. First of all, I love little moments that they have, you know, when he's presented this key to get into the safe house, which was so cool that this is a real little door that you can go to yeah. um, in London. I'm sure many people have um, that I love. And I love the whole thing of this skeleton key getting him in. Yeah. I do also love, I don't like the part with M when they're going back and forth. Again, oh, yeah. it's this kind of cold neutral M that I'm just not buying. I do not like 
the cube branch scene where they're showing all the artifacts. And as a prop guy, as a collector, I should love that. And I did at the time when I was younger. Mm. Now I'm just like, wow, are they really pandering? The smelling of, you know, Rosa Klebb's shoe. And I, I get it. It's made for, all of it's made for laughs. You know, the Bell mm. Rocket Pack and things like that. I'm just like, I like those little subtle moments that they had in the film so much better. But I do love the fact that he gets this. Ah, Which is nice. the sonic ring i mean that it's just a cool simple little prop mm. i love the fact that it's a wearable it's an accessory it's back to this whole thing of like in thunderbolt where he can kind of wear and put on these things and yeah. i love the way he uses it in the end mm. but we got to talk about the car yep we do <laughs> so the invisible car is probably when someone talks about die another day they refer to either the cgi tsunami mm-hmm which I'm sure we'll talk about on its own. <laughs> and they talk about invisible cars. And literally the producers even say, we went a step too far with invisible cars. Like mm. everybody uses invisible cars. Last night when I saw this, I was fine with the invisible car. Hey, Maybe, be, maybe I'm getting soft in my old age. I don't know, but I'm like, <laughs> there's technology out there with tiny little cameras. Let's go mm. one step farther and say, maybe they could have done it to make it look like a real car and not just a bunch of little cameras and, you know, who's to say they wouldn't be on the cutting edge? And I even like how he utilizes it in the film. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And it's a beautiful car. Mm. So I just, I'm fine now with invisible cars. Amazing. It's oh, wow. Amazing. I, I thought we were going to have a fight over this. because I'm, I'm, I'm fully on board with it. And the Vanquish is, oh, hooray, I, I can hold up a a what? thing <laughs> i know i have this model this of is the, historical uh, the oh, vanquish yeah. here with a few gadgets in, is that in the it, one with the um the shotguns coming out of the hood oh there we go um, oh see that's uh, so cool yeah i've had now, that did you get that in and around the movie or after oh yeah 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 um i think it's just like a yeah corgi one or uh something like that relative i think it's it auto Christmas, art think. it's the 118th auto art B brilliant yep no, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll take that yeah. just yeah maybe maybe under. auto art i have no idea Anyway, it's it's great. I love that car. I think second to like yeah. the DB5 and maybe the Lotus. Um, yeah. I, you know, it's one of my favorite Aston Martins. I really like the whole invisibility thing. And we're going to get to talking about the car chase sequence. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think it's a, I think that element of it has aged quite well, because I think at one point right. in time, y you would have ruled your eyes at it. But now that I feel like big budget films are kind of going into a more fantastical space and all this kind of stuff, it doesn't stand out as much, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so we ne next we go to Iceland. It's been a big mm. chunk of the film there. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll talk about it kind of broadly because a lot goes on here. Um, I, I, for me, this is my favorite chunk of the film, actually. Like from the moment that the, he arrives at the Ice Palace until he's reviving Halle Berry, I kind of love, except for the dialogue scenes with Gustav Graves, mm. <laughs> everything else in there, I really like. I even like Bond kind of sparring with Halle Berry at the bar and when Miranda comes in, I know the whole Big Bang Theory thing is really on the nose and uh, quite shit, but I like it. Um, yeah, uh, how do you feel about this chunk broadly? It's often the part of the film that people dog on the most. Yeah. I do like the fact that the sets and the ice palace and the little little things that they have here, um, like uh, the ice glasses that they have. That um, is, yeah, is that actually chilled or is that no, an effect? Oh, that's no, so this cool. is a prop effect that they have from the movie where uh, it makes it look like it's iced over and chilled. Yeah, amazing. Crazy, right? Yeah. But um, I, I'm fine with the ice palace. I, I hmm. love the sets inside. They look big and bondish. You know, they look like they're from the 60s, you know, and those types of things. A lot of people don't like the uh, the Ice Palace. I do like it. And I le even like some of the side conversations that go on with uh, Bond when he's in kind of that uh, greenhouse effect. Oh, yeah. And and we're going to be in total agreement. I think Bond, <laughs> Bond, I think Brosnan looks so badass here in the black turtleneck, mm. using the rebreather and everything like that to go under the water. I think this part, although it gets dogged on, actually has much more good moments than bad moments. Mm. Um, there are some cringy lines, but by this time in the film, I'm forgiving them mm. because there's like larger than life scenes. And then we usher into the, to the car chase, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a moment, but that just 
elevates everything to me. The car chase is phenomenal. I just love it so much. It, it, it's it's a stroke of genius to give the villain a car that's just as gadget laden as Bond's is. The location where they're shooting on this frozen lake is just beautiful. I think they use the ejector seat in such a yes. cool, inventive way. It's probably my favorite moment of the film. I think Brosnan sells it really well, where he like use it, flips the thing over, and then he just has this little like nod of like, yep, yeah. yeah, that was cool, <laughs> and yeah. presses the thing. I love it so much. Um, I really like Zhao in that bit as well. I think he's just like a good foil again, just this heavy, you know, uh, physically threatening henchman. Um, and he's really good. I think there are just some bits that irritate me when it comes to the background in the in this whole like Iceland sequence. There are some mm. because I don't think I think they filmed a good chunk of it on Pinewood yeah. with the uh, with the, the the main cast. And there are just some backdrops that just look so you can tell it's just like a board that's been put up there and you're supposed to think it goes off into the distance, but it really doesn't. Yeah, well, uh, this may be one of the rare times where I bought into that much more than you. It became almost white noise. I didn't even notice that. And then I, I will say, just going back to the car sequence um, real quickly, when you compare this to, say, the car sequence between Hinks and Bond Inspector, mm. um, which is supposed to be kind of a riff. I mean, it's supposed to be the same thing, a bad guy with two nice cars chasing mm. each other, blah, blah, blah. This is so effective. And where before I talked about the editing of like that staccato kind of focus and the slow-mo and stuff, I almost ignored it or was able to get over it easier here because the car chase is so effective. It's so well done. It's so exciting. It's so intelligent and mm -hmm. they're so well matched. You actually feel like Bond has some jeopardy here. Mm -hmm. And then even Zhao's demise, you know, we, we've had so many henchmen that have just ridiculous demises. I mean, just something very simple. This was pretty good because he uses that invisibility to, to work for him. I, I just, yeah, I, it's a winner for me, that part. Amazing. Yeah, no, I, I think they use the invisibility really inventively there um, in particular, because I know that in some places where he's using it in a more stealthy capacity, it can be a bit like, are you sure they're not just hearing the engine ring? <laughs> they're not just wondering what this, oh, this is an impressive engine sound coming from somewhere. You know, it's um, interesting because what I've noticed something about our chat already. Mm. I think we're both in agreement that where the writers failed in the human to human dialogue, the interaction, the building of chemistry in the mm. story, they actually were very creative and I think very thoughtful in the way they did plot and, mm. and circumstances. So the way they used gadgets, I think, you know, you had real gadget use, like he used all the things very effectively. And even the way that some of the bad guys got their comeuppance, which we'll talk about in a second. I think there was some effectiveness there too. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, so we need to talk about the tsunami sequence. I'm Do sorry, we? but- uh... <laughs> I think everybody would be okay if we skipped it. No. <laughs> um, it, 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 is, it, it is something else. Um, I, 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 you, obviously we know it's coming and every time it comes, it's just as bad as I remember it. It is something that has never really, it's never, I've never appreciated it on even a campy level. It looks so ridiculous with Bond looking really rubbery as he's like the CG Bond rubbing, uh, yeah. moving around. Um, bless Brosnan for selling it like on his face. He, he looks good in the moment, I think, but uh, it's so ridiculous and so silly and looks so crap. I just think it's, uh, yeah. It's it's it, it's a low point. How do you yeah. feel? I tell you, going into it last night, as probably we all go into it if we watch the movie, I went into it with the analogy of if I went into a um, a place to adopt a puppy, mm -hmm. and the puppy had two legs, not even three, but two legs, so it had to like literally hop around. It had no top legs. Um, would I be that person to go? I want to be the person to love that two-legged puppy. I'm going to adopt that two-legged puppy. So I went in there saying, I want to be the person to love this tsunami scene, to find something mm. to love about it. I'm going to adopt this tsunami scene. But that two-legged puppy is still at the pound and David didn't adopt it. <laughs> I could not find anything redeeming about this from the vehicle that he's driving to the laser chasing him for no damn good reason to show up on a big map and satellite. I, I just Nothing. And... Even Brosnan, like when he's like holding that thing and going like this, I just honestly, the takeaway was 
I felt bad for Brosnan. I felt like when he was doing the Golden Eye Watch Along, and I wanted mm. to hold him and swaddle him and go, "It's going to be okay." <laughs> I wanted to do that with the tsunami scene last night, and it, it was not a good feeling. It is one of the you, you you can't help but just look at him and just think like, "God, you are so much better than this." <laughs> I don't know why. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, bless him. Uh, but anyway, we can move on from that unpleasantness now <laughs> and get into the final act of the film. We have this a little bit in uh, Korea where M comes over and Michael Madsen, who is a, a notable actor, if not a notable character in the series. I, I guess it stuck out to me, actually. Maybe this is really uh, sort of obvious, but it, it's the first time that I've noticed that, oh, wow, they really were setting up that Jinx film where he was going to come back. They have a line where... He says something about, oh, I'm, you know, that would mean going against the president's orders. And she says, well, when's that ever stopped you? And they just cut to him and just hold for a moment. And you're like, oh, wow, OK, that's what they would have picked up on in the Jinx film. That would have been, you know, a, a, an element of that, I, I assume. Um, as it stands, he's just, he just sticks out to me too much because I know Michael Madsen from, you know, uh, Quentin Tarantino films and he's a very recognisable character actor. Um, did, did he stand out to you in that way or does he just kind of fade into the background? I mean, he was absolutely faded into the background for me, mm. and maybe worse. He was one oh. of those unfortunate actors, because, I mean, he's been in Reservoir Dogs. He's a good actor. You mm. know, he's a subtle actor. You won't get big, bombastic things out of him. But every line of his was delivered the same way. Mm. And his moments of, like, you know, you know, the dislike of Bond was, again, it was too extreme. I mean, mm -hmm. when you see how they did it in Quantum of Solace, it was, it was done so much better with subtlety. Mm -hmm. His was just, again, it was like that twirling mustache over the top. And then there's this weird editing, I blame the director moment, where when, you know, the, the laser gets cut off, when the plane kind of explodes and the laser stops and mm -hmm. everybody sighs, sighs relief, all they know is that the laser stopped, but he puts a cigarette in his mouth as if it's all over and it's all okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, I'd be like, oh shit, when's the next explosion gonna come? Cause maybe yeah. they're just like recharging. <laughs> and it's, to me, it just goes back to this. It's like, they're just going by the numbers and it mm. seemed a little lazy. Yeah, that that is completely, I think more than any of, I know that the Brosnan era gets a lot of criticism for this as feeling like a bit of a box ticking affair, like, okay, well, we have the gadgets, we have the girls, we have the exotic locations, all that, but really, and I feel like you get a sense from some of the behind the scenes stuff where you hear the director talking about it, he does just sort of treat it like it is a bit of a checklist and he's like right well we've got to have that and we've got to have that and we've got to have that just because we've got to have it rather than it yeah. being central to the story that they're telling which is a an issue anyway all of my goodwill has disappeared now david because we get to the uh, the final antonov oh. uh sequence which uh it, it it ends the film on a really sour note for me i really don't like this whole kind of last act and to your point earlier actually because i you you mentioned um gustav graves's father um who is inexplicably brought back here for uh, this emotional moment which i I think the dad, the actor, I, I don't know his name, he's brilliant. Like, I think he's really yes. good. I think if if there is a, a heart to the film, it is him and his relationship that he wants to have with his son. But Toby Stevens is just, oh, there's that awful shot where he, like, turns around to see his dad and he's got those magnifying, like, glasses things on. And it's, yeah, I, there's just so many moments that I just, I, I, I can't get invested in the emotion that I think I'm supposed to be feeling because I just... I'm only buying one half of it, and that's that dad guy. Come, come see the rising of your son. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. But um, <laughs> I agree with you. I think that that actor and that moment could have been, I, I wouldn't say redeeming of everything with Gustav's Graves, but somewhat mm. redeeming of the actor. Um, and, you know, even the way he strokes the statue's face, mm. and then he goes up to his son. For some reason, I thought I remembered... Toby Stevens like reacting almost like very fondly to that. He's just mm. literally just looking at him like, mm. yeah, like you know when's when's the uh, catering going to come? Like I yeah. want coffee. Like <laughs> nothing's going on out of mm. these actors. And mm. you know I know we're gonna get right into it, but you know I gotta go back to like you know my little jinx moments where I get it. She's a knife thrower and things like that. I'm not buying this. And here is, I'm going to drop this in my groin. Just I'm to, just like, I, I'm on the edge of my seat now. <laughs> I have the last time. <laughs> no, um, I'm going to put it down. 
and uh, count my blessings. But I have seen her, and you probably did as well, in one of the John Wick movies. And she's phenomenally a very good combat person. She's a very good action person. In this, I just didn't buy it. She's, you know, 25 pounds soaking wet, knocks out the pilot, you know, mm -hmm. with one punch without even putting her back into it. Mm -hmm. um, the fight I also found between the two women, mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't know. I didn't buy it this time. It mm -hmm. was just very strange. And it was like, na 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 and not very exciting. I, I really don't like how they they have to pair them off. Like the women have to fight and the men have to fight. Like that just feels it feels all a bit too neat in that yes. way. And with the uh, with the um, Miranda Frost and Jinx fight, it's like Miranda goes up to her and like takes her by sword point somewhere, and it's like, what are you going to do with her? Like I I you know, there's no kind of what is the plan here? Why don't you just kill her now? And I know that you're not supposed to ask those questions when it comes to Bond films, but that one just stuck out to me as being a real, like, yeah. you're just asking for trouble by leaving her alive and guiding her somewhere. Um, why is she practicing her sword fighting on a plane? It's, it's, yeah, it's quite bizarre. But even the fight between Bond and Gustav with him and his Sith lightning, like, coming out of his hands, I just, uh, I just despair. And I know it's supposed to be aping the fight that Bond has with uh, Goldfinger at the end of Goldfinger, and obviously mm. the villain gets sucked out of the plane into the engine, well, not in Goldfinger, into the engine, but um, it's supposed to be doing that, yeah. but it's just the faces, it's the Brosnan Payne face, it's the Toby Steve, like, I think when he puts the face next to the bust and oh. the kind of posing, it's just so, it's so overblown, it's so overdone. Parachutes it's, for the both of us, not anymore. And that's so, that's so. got to be the director going yeah. I, I guarantee it where he's like you know it'd be great is let's have the dichotomy of the two faces you know this and this and if you could just hold it and the actors are probably like bloody hell when is this just going to be over <laughs> like we were yeah. saying yeah. at this point in the film and I, I'll, I'll say that the fight between the two of them was particularly ponderous last mm. night when I was watching it because it felt like it just went on and on and wouldn't stop and then you had this bad guy doing kind of a 1960s thing of talking to Bond Mm. Like spending too much time as opposed to let me just electrocute him and have at it. And yeah. I get it. The film would be over and it's a Bond movie, but I'm just not invested at this point. I'm done with the movie. And I'm like, just show the nice sports cars falling at this point. Yeah. Well, I think I think we're both on a similar page. Like the stuff that we liked about Iceland, like particularly that uh, car chase scene. It, like that feels like a climax like he saves Halle Berry that you know it, it feels like it could just stop there but then we have this extra 20 minutes where they mm. have to go and get on the plane and everything and it it just feels tacked on you know what scared me Calvin last night about watching this film is when I was watching them jump out with the switchblades mm. I almost got a no me bond no time to die feeling yeah and I'm like they have to go and basically infiltrate a place with those they're fighting together oh no like <laughs> and i'm like didn't it just get it out of your brain david it's they're not going to repeat that mistake but i i did get that feeling and i i agree with you i literally think if they had extended the ice palace scene mm. so you see the demise of gustav's grave within that scene you know that that maybe it's a a, a layer within mm. that scene and ended it there it would have been better yeah because even when they show, <laughs> when the helicopter thing does the whole Tom Cruise, you know, pull up thing, mm. I just felt to myself, you know what? They're in that little hut and I just don't care about them. Yeah. Like here, I don't care about Bond. I don't care about their relationship. And the ending is just so unsatisfying. The little dialogue between the two of them is cringeworthy again. And I'm just not invested. Yeah. No, I, I'm the same. It's it's a real bum note to end on. The whole money penny thing as well, where she's in the VR thing with Bond. I, I kind of liked that when I was younger. Yeah, it was I'm cute. Not, I'm not sure how I feel about it anymore because <laughs> I, I like I'm I'm kind of okay with it, but I know I know that it does kind of ruin the money penny character a bit to have her in that way, but uh I don't hate it as much as I hate Bond and Jinx in that little hut in Cornwall or wherever they are. Well, can you imagine, so 2002, this film, can you mm. imagine some of the things in this film, you know, an Asian being made into a Caucasian, mm. um, Money Penny with the whole human resource issues that she goes on. Yeah. Um, but a lot of these things in 2021, they mm. wouldn't fly. There's yeah. no way this would get passed through. Yeah.
No, that's very true, actually. Yeah. The whole, yeah, the uh, Korean turning into a yeah, white guy. That never occurred to me, actually. But no, you're completely right. That would totally be a red flag to a lot of uh, yeah outlets exactly. these days. Interesting. So in, in short, we love the film. <laughs> Well, to talk, to kind of wrap up with final thoughts on this, um, I, 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 I actually enjoyed watching this like last night. Like, sorry, the words were getting like stuck in my throat, then yeah. I couldn't quite get it out. I don't know if it's just because I've been so soaked in the Craig era recently and how emotionally charged and dramatic that is. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing because I, I really like that. To come to Dine of the Day and just experience it as just let it wash over you as just a bit of like bubble gum fun in places parts had me up rolling my eyes and thinking god this is terrible but i i, I you know i can't lie my brain did switch off and i just enjoyed the bits yeah. that i enjoyed and i feel like i got something out of this because in the past there have been times where i've sat down to watch it thinking oh it's so bad i'll just have a laugh along with it and i just come out bored this time I did have a good time, actually. Um, and the bits that I liked, I really liked. And the bits that I didn't like, I really didn't like. So it's a bit of a roller coaster. Going into it, I thought I was going to be coming out of like, I like the second half and I don't like the first half. But just what you said, it's like this. Yeah. No, actually, it's more forensic than that. I need to like snip out the bits that I like and don't like. Exactly. Because I think my takeaway with this movie is I, I could so see you liking the certain parts that you like because they can be silly. And we mm. talk about gooey pizza how you you know when you're in the mood for gooey pizza we've seen this rash of very serious daniel craig movies mm. um this is not that this is just you know what kind of just relax and enjoy the the silliness of it all mm. and yeah I, I i think i let myself go a little bit more than usual which is good hmm I, I am stunned how much on the same page we were with this one. I honestly thought we were going to have some real, uh, like, I thought you were going to like the first half, I was going to like the second half, but it sounds like we've been, yeah, a bit more evenly mixed, which is, uh, yeah, which is we'll interesting. We'll have to do this again with some of the ones that we think are popular, but unpopular, but we think mm. our opinions are going to be the same opinions. Good shout. Yeah. Well, it's over on your channel next, so we'll have to, yes, uh, it is. yeah have a talk about what we're going to do for the next one. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, well, David Zaritsky, Mr. Bond Experience himself, thank you so much for joining me again for this debate and or discussion, rather. Um, and thank you very much, particularly for putting yourself through the two hours of watching this film. My therapist will thank you as well. <laughs> right, until next time, see you. Take care.